We're just waiting for a couple of documents, I think. Just give me, give us two minutes, sorry. Okay, I think we're, we're set to, to begin. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals at the City Council. And during today's hearing, we will review the fiscal 2021 preliminary plan preliminary capital budget and preliminary capital commitment plan for New York City Health and Hospitals, as well as examine h and performance indicators from the January 2020 preliminary mayor's management report. Let me start off by recognizing in light of the spread of the coronavirus health and hospitals vital role in the city's efforts to increase its preparedness and its emergency response capacity. We discussed this in some detail at Thursday's joint hearing with the Committee on Health, and I want to emphasize that this committee and the Council are committed to supporting H&H &H and the City in meeting the public health challenge that COVID-19 poses to all of our communities. We know that safety net hospitals play a critical part more broadly in serving our city's most vulnerable and marginalized people, including undocumented immigrants, low-income children, and people with mental illness and substance abuse issues. The launch and ongoing expansion of NYC Care in particular presents an opportunity to extend primary care to those who have traditionally faced barriers to accessing health services. At the same time, we encourage H&H &H to demonstrate greater transparency with respect to the allocation of program funds, $25 million this fiscal year and $75 million in the next, and to the impact on emergency department utilization and other outcomes. It is no secret that H&H &H faces a range of federal and state budget risks that, if enacted, would undermine the system's efforts to achieve financial sustainability, especially in light of deficits projected at $1.3 billion in fiscal 2020 and $1.5 billion in fiscal 2021 in lieu of any corrective actions. The scheduled federal cuts to the Medicaid disproportionate share hospital program slated to occur in May if congressional action is not taken contribute in large part to the projected decline from $2.5 billion in fiscal year 2020 to $1.5 billion in fiscal 2021 in overall supplemental Medicaid payments to the system. We are similarly dismayed that the state is proposing changes to the Medicaid local district cost share that could impose an estimated $1.1 billion burden on the city, potentially hampering its ability to deliver services at H&H &H and beyond. And we remain vigilant about adverse impacts on the system that may come from the Medicaid redesign team, a panel already lacking in city or H&H &H representation. The city, of course, is, is expected to provide nearly $1.1 billion in support to H&H &H for fiscal year 2021. And while budget challenges from Albany and Washington are undoubtedly salient to the state of H&H's &H finances, it is imperative that New York City taxpayers and New York City patients who utilize services at H&H &H have a say in ensuring that the hospital system holds itself to high patient quality standards. The inpatient satisfaction rate at H&H &H was reported at approximately 62% in the January 2020 preliminary mayor's management report, largely unchanged from previous fiscal years, and again raises the question of quality improvement. H&H, &H, after all, competes with other providers for patient volume, and as H&H &H also seeks to increase Metro Plus enrollment and the health plan's share of medical spending within the system, we should remember that this too needs to go hand in hand with a prioritization of patient outcomes and experience. In thinking about the system over the long term, we hope to hear today about 
how H&H's $2.5 billion capital commitment plan for fiscal 2020 to 2024, which includes funding for primary health clinics and continued recovery from Hurricane Sandy, among other needs, can modernize and keep H&H's infrastructure facilities and equipment up to date. I would like to thank Matthew Siegler uh, and John Ulberg for coming here today and testifying, as well as H&H and OMB staff for being responsive to our requests. I would also like to thank both my staff and the hospital's committee staff, finance analyst John Chang, counsel Zay Emanuel Halu, and policy analyst Emily, Emily Bolkin for their help in preparing for this hearing. And I look forward to the conversation today, and I would like uh, now to call upon the following to testify. We have Matthew, Matt Siegler, John Ulberg, and Dr. Yang, you'll just, do you want to join or do you want to just answer questions as they come up? Okay, I'm going to ask one. <laughs> Fair warning. Great. Um, if you're going to provide testimony or answer questions, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera, members of the committee. I'm Matt Siegler, New York City Health and Hospital Senior Vice President for Managed Care and Patient Growth and the Chief Executive Officer uh, for One City Health. I'm joined today by John Ulberg, our Chief Financial Officer. Um, Dr. Katz uh, apologizes he could not be here. He is uh, uh, spending a great portion of his time on the COVID response and is currently uh, in the midst of that. Uh, John and I are here to talk about our finances. Of course, the coronavirus outbreak around the world and here at home is, is top of mind. Uh, as we shared with you last Thursday, uh, Health and Hospitals is prepared. We've activated our emergency management and response operations. We're taking aggressive steps to ensure we have plans, guidelines, resources in place to provide safe care to anyone who may present with COVID-19 infection. Despite this serious and emerging public health threat, which we are all concerned about and addressing, uh, we're here to report on our finances. And we are pleased to report that Health and Hospitals has closed the first half of FY20 on track, and we project to close the year with a strong cash balance of $790 million. We remain deeply concerned about the proposed state Medicaid cuts, which would cause significant harm to New York City's public health system, and we look forward to partnering with you in our advocacy to prevent these cuts from happening. Health and Hospitals has had two great years, uh, as long as uh, I've been here, many years before, but the last two have been particularly good, um, and we're proud of the progress and success of our health system's transformation. We're generating more revenue by appropriately billing insurance companies uh, and improving our outpatient coding and physician billing practices. More patients are signing up for health insurance inside our hospitals. We've seen a 20% annual increase in insurance applications. We're negotiating with insurance companies for fair rates for the services they provide to their members, as well as settlements for back payments they owe us. We're providing more specialized clinical services with higher reimbursement rates, while continuing to expand access to primary care for all. As of December, all health and hospitals, acute care facilities, and federally qualified health centers are on one unified electronic health record system, which will help our clinicians provide safe, efficient, quality care as it, as it helps us document, code, and bill insurance companies more effectively. We've opened six express care centers where patients with lower acuity complaints can bypass the emergency department to have their immediate medical problems addressed rapidly with a smooth transition to ongoing primary care, which we're particularly proud of. Our recently ratified four-year NISNA contract will allow health and hospitals to pay fair wages, ensure safe, safe staffing, and improve recruitment and retention of our nurses. We're very proud that we've hired 600 nurses over the last two years, and we look forward to partnering with our NISNA partners in the future. With the launch of NYC Care in Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, we're increasing access to primary and specialty care, and we've launched a redesigned interfacility ambulance system that will transport patients faster and more efficiently between our sites. The new system is expected to generate $21 million in new insurance revenue through retention inside our system. We've closed the first half of FY20 on track. We are uh, only 8.5 million or less than 0.25% below our annual operating budget for the first half of the fiscal year. Our expenses are $37.6 million over budget due to higher than expected overtime and other, other costs and we'll continue to transition away from oversign positions and temp positions to permanent positions uh, to address that. 
Balancing this, we've exceeded our revenue targets by over $29 million, thanks to our efforts in patient care and revenue cycle operations. We've had an overall increase of patient care revenue by over $225 million versus the same period last year, and we'll continue to implement the aggressive targets in our tra transformation plan, including managing denials of health plans, which continues to be a major challenge. We're projecting a strong closing cash balance of $790 million for FY20 and $869 million for FY21. However, we are facing formidable budgetary externalities on the federal and state levels, and as such, we continue to focus on prudent financial management. We'll increase our transformation plan targets for revenue for health insurance initiatives from $552 million in FY20 to $710 million in FY24 by continuing to improve clinical documentation, coding, and billing to collect payments that are due for services rendered, continue to negotiate better with managed care plans, and preventing unfair denials. We'll also continue to work to increase Metro Plus's medical spend within our system and to connect more New Yorkers to affordable health insurance. We have also implemented transformation plan growth initiatives that are protected to increase revenue from 75 million in FY20 to 135 million in FY24. These include expanding primary care access through more parts of New York City and throughout we continue to control administrative expenses. We are facing significant headwinds from Albany and Washington DC. In order to manage the state budget, the governor has implemented $599 million in cuts to the Medicaid program, growing to $851 million in state fiscal year 2021. As a result, we have already absorbed over $35 million loss in one year from the across the board cuts that were promulgated on January 1st. And we also remain deeply concerned about the proposed elimination of $51 million in enhanced safety net hospital funding. Ensuring appropriate funding for safety net hospitals is critical to our mission. The governor has reconvened the Medicaid redesign team to find $2.5 billion in state Medicaid savings. If the MRT fails to find the savings, the state is authorized to implement across the board cuts to achieve savings. That would be devastating to New York City's only public hospital system, a safety net for 1.1 million New Yorkers. We're grateful to the elected officials, community representatives, and city and state leaders who are supporting us in trying to find a better path forward. On the federal level, we have a reprieve with a delay in the Medicaid disproportionate share hospital cuts until May 22nd. That yielded $343 million for the current fiscal year. However, if the cuts are not delayed further, as the chair mentioned, uh, health and hospitals is slated to lose $580 million in FY21 and $623 million each year thereafter. It's important to note that if the dish cuts are not delayed, New York State must change its formula on how it distributes dish funding to drive this critical funding stream to hospitals that provide the most care to low income and uninsured New Yorkers. The council has been instrumental in previous advocacy efforts to delay dish cuts, especially you, Chair Rivera. We really appreciate your assistance and we look forward to continuing to working with you to fight back against these damaging cuts. The Trump administration also continues to launch cruel attacks on immigrants in our city and around the country. The recent promulgation of the public charge rule in February is a particularly galling example of it. More than 100,000 health and hospitals patients could change their behavior out of concern about the rule, even if they are not directly impacted by the rule itself. Many may disenroll from coverage, refuse to enroll, or use fewer preventive services, which could result in downstream increase of high severity inpatient services. Our midline estimate, based on the chilling effect we saw following the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, shows that there could be financial impact of approximately $121 million in the first 12 months. Uh, so that is a great concern to us that we continue to monitor. Lastly, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has denied New York State's request for a funding extension for its delivery system reform incentive payment program, DISRIP. DISRIP is now scheduled to end on March 31st, 2020. New York State uh, shifted a significant portion of its Medicaid payments away from fee-for-service towards value-based payment arrangements uh, under DISRIP, and performing, performing provider systems like One City Health, which I lead the state's largest PPS, achieved a 21% reduction in avoidable hospital admissions. One City Health will lose money on the opportunity to gain the leftover funds that we could earn by continuing this program. Uh, however, h, h continues its commitment to value-based care and targeted comprehensive services for the most vulnerable New Yorkers, and we look forward to working with you to advance value-based payment in the state of New York uh, to achieve our goals. So thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to taking your questions.
Great, thank you so much. So a couple of, um, certainly gonna ask you about the coronavirus in a second, but I wanted to, you mentioned the, a number of the state and federal budget challenges, the cuts to Medicaid, uh, the dish payments scheduled to occur in May if Congress doesn't act, as well as the governor's proposal to increase localities' contribution to the state Medicaid program, which we is estimated to be $1.1 billion for the city. And of course, that's, that's likely to hamper the city's ability to fund services at H&H &H and just more generally. So you also mentioned that you've hired a number of nurses, and we're very glad that you could work closely with NISNA. But do, do you anticipate closures or layoffs at H&H &H imminent? Or we don't. We, we think our transformation plan and our overall financial plan is sound. The, uh, the support in Congress and, of course, around New York State to delay the dish cuts further we think is very strong. Uh, and then we continue to work in uh, close partnership with the state to try to provide them a better path forward on addressing Medicaid cuts. So uh, we think those things can come together and our overall uh, financial plan um, puts us in a solid position to avoid any, any cuts like you mentioned. You know, I'm someone that always wants to prepare for the absolute worst that could happen. So if, if there were state and federal cuts, you know, with, with all of the risks and things that are going on, how would H&H &H go about prioritizing particular services staff and or some of the facilities in response to some of the state and federal risks? Go about prioritizing? I mean, I think it would be a holistic conversation with the administration and with the council around uh, the key areas of service that health and hospitals provides. Um, you know, our, our priority is always to provide safe and high quality care. We've never jeopardized that. Um, and again, I think we you know, try to prepare these things and look at the fiscal impacts of them, but uh, we do feel optimistic about it and continuing to focus on our growth efforts rather than preparing detailed plans on, on any contingency like that. When we met and, and we discussed the, the budget briefly, I know you're working very, very closely uh, with some of the organizations out there and making sure that you're taking care of your staff. And they are on the front lines, especially now with everything going on. And the administration announced last week that H&H that &H has activated its emergency operations center and incident command system, as well as conducted drills across emergency departments to evaluate facilities' ability to implement infection control measures in, in preparation for COVID-19. So as highlighted in the one pager, and you, I know you mentioned it in the beginning of the testimony, H&H &H says it has spent $1.7 to date on coronavirus preparation. Going forward, what do you anticipate will be the near-term costs associated with H&H's continued preparation and potential response to the coronavirus? Sure. So I, I can speak to a little bit of that. I will just say at the outset, you know, Dr. Katz did hope he could be here. He is our clinician-in-chief and expert on these things. It is an evolving situation, so uh, I, will, I will defer the more clinical and operational questions on that to him to a later point. Um, more globally on, on the coronavirus response, I'll say health and hospitals focus, and one of the great benefits of having a public hospital system is that the money is not our primary focus, right? We are focused 100% on high quality patient care, keeping our staff and the public safe. Uh, that is what comes first and why our uh, clinicians are so focused on that. Uh, to date, I think John can update you on what we've spent and we continue to track it. Our view of it is do the right thing, follow the guidance of the city in close partnership to provide the best possible care, uh, and the financial aspects of it will, will follow after the fact, but the patient care really comes first. What is, uh, just the, you wanna talk about the yeah, most I'll, recent I, tracking? Yeah, so we, we uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, health and hospitals and the rest of the city has been through, you know, various disasters in the past, and we mobilize our teams and finances is involved in that. Um, we do keep track on a daily basis, the expenditures associated, you know, with the disaster, with the coronavirus, the number's up to $2.1 million. It's important that we have accurate accounting uh, so that when, you know, federal funds or state dollars or whatever dollars become available to us, we have the appropriate accounting. But that number will clearly go up as the virus, you know, progresses. But as Matt said, you know, our direction to our clinicians is, you know, battle the problem and we'll figure out the money later if you could just speak a little bit louder Sorry. because no yeah. it's it's okay. it could be me yeah. but we'll, we'll get to we'll get to that another time <laughs> that you said because i think i heard 2.1 million 
Yes, the, okay. the number's uh, $2.1 million, and what I was uh, trying to say is that we, we, as part of any disaster, it's our job in finance to track the expenditures associated with the disaster. So we've mobilized that as, as part of the, the team that Matt mentioned, uh, where we keep track of the expenditures. Our advice to the clinicians is to, you know, battle the problem, and we'll keep track of the money and, and, and take care of that later. So th the new number is 2.1 as of this afternoon. So what, what support can the council provide that would be most helpful to the hospital system in addressing the coronavirus as part of the budget process and beyond? I, I think, you know, I'll defer to, to Dr. Katz and others on the specific response to, to COVID-19. I, I will say, you know, certainly your support uh, on, in Albany and with the federal government on those proposed cuts, we certainly don't need additional headwinds uh, in the face of the challenging and evolving situation we're dealing with. Uh, I'm sure there will be further discussion about uh, coronavirus and specific state steps the council and the administration can take, but uh, from John and my perspective, I think the, the focus on these other externalities that are large and direct threats to health and hospitals is a, is a key area of partnership for us. So you also mentioned, um, and again, I, I know that Dr. Katz couldn't be here because he's, he's working around the clock on this issue, so I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for, for the numbers. We're just, you know, we want to be helpful to H&H. &H, and I realize lobbying our colleagues in Albany and making sure that Congress does act in terms of the delay. Um, but if there is something that we can do besides kind of send this sober message of not to panic and for everyone to be aware and to, to practice safer habits, um, because the money is a real issue, right? This is already 2.1 million. We're at an, and I ex, and I expect this will be ongoing for some time. So, so let me just ask you a few few questions. Hopefully, you can answer these a little bit more directly. I want to get a little bit. You know, I'll wait in case uh, Council Member Moya attends. But let me ask about the public charge. So, in your public charge overview handout. And you mentioned in the testimony as well that H and H estimates that more than 100,000 H and H patients could change their behavior in response to the rule of the chilling effect. Additionally, H and H says its midline estimate for the potential financial impact is approximately 121 million in the first 12 months. Can you elaborate on the assumptions underlying these estimates? Um, I think we can speak to some of the specifics in it. I, I'll say, you know, the, some of the key things that we look for, you know, Metro Plus enrollment and disenrollment are a key indicator that we watch for. Uh, it's tough to disaggregate some of this in terms of the tracking the actual impact, in part because, as I know you know, the, the number of people who are actually affected by the rule is so much less than the number of people who are intimidated by it and whose behavior could change by it. So, um, you know, our overall patient volumes uh, have declined, but have declined by less than in previous years. Uh, Metro Plus enrollment, as I said, is another thing to track. And then, you know, we look for, for anecdotal responses at different clinical settings for how uh, responses are happening, and we track that. But those are some of the assumptions underneath it. And um, our financial counseling success rate is another measure that I believe was part of the assumptions. And so that's what we look at. What protocols does H and H have in place to inform prospective patients about their ability to access services at the health system? And really quickly, I just want to acknowledge, of course, my colleagues, uh, Diana Ayala, Antonio Reynoso, and Alan Mazel. So again, sorry, in terms of public charge, what protocols does H and H have in place to inform prospective patients about their ability to access services at the health system? Sure. So uh, our our call center staff our financial counseling staff, all of our ambulatory care, uh, and other uh, clinical administrative staff who greet our patients and meet them, our hospital police, uh, all have been trained and received the message in uh, how all of our patients should seek care without fear, and getting the care they need is by far our priority, and we do not care about their immigration status, nor will we inquire about it or track it. So there's uh, significant signage put up at the facilities, uh, that training and information has gone out to all levels of our staff multiple times, and we continue to reinforce it. it as, as I think you know, it's not one thing that you just send out once and then say, you know, okay, the system understands this. We continue to, uh, to, um, to share those messages with the staff and encourage them to communicate that directly to, um, uh, to our patients. We also have an ongoing contract that I know the, the council
Council supports uh, with the New York Legal Assistance Group. They are now in all of our 11 acute care facilities and uh, we share contact information with them with any patients with questions because uh, we can give advice and share information but a lot of this stuff is, is significantly complicated and so the advice and guidance of a lawyer uh, is necessary as someone is making some of these decisions. So we encourage people to refer to that uh, and I think it's been a very productive partnership in, in helping people. So you said NILAG is present in, in every acute care facility? Are, isn't there, do you have a marketing campaign at all in, in, inside the facility? I thought I saw, um, I know you said there's ample signage, but you have the legal services present. You've kind of informed the staff on what to say to an individual who is seeking services. Is anything going beyond that in terms of media or marketing? I think you had a, and you're working, are you working closely with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs? We are. They're a key partner in this. Uh, I think they are uh, primarily the lead on the public spend and the advertising for this, uh, but our, uh, uh, their messaging is shared broadly through all of our social media and other channels. Um, in terms of direct advertising purchases by health and hospitals, I think we have partnered with other parts of the administration to advance that. So one media campaign I have noticed is NYC Care. And right now, we, you've launched in the Bronx. You launched last year in the Bronx and since expanded to Brooklyn and Staten Island. And the preliminary budget dedicates $75 million to NYC Care for fiscal year 2021, growing from $25 million in our current fiscal year. Can you give us a breakdown of NYC Care-related personal services and other than personal OTPS, other than personal services spending to date? And given the program's launch and expansion, how does h, &H plan to spend the increase for fiscal year 21? So I will say that yes, those numbers are all correct. The 25 million grows to 75 million. Um, and I will also say that we think uh, in terms of the model and the actual expenditures, we, we're in the process of looking at that now. We believe that our model is holding up pretty well in terms of the enrollment numbers because it's driven by you know, how many people actually enroll in NYC CARES. It was 13,000 last January. It's growing with uh, the addition of Brooklyn and, Brooklyn and Staten Island on pace with where we thought the model would take us. So that's a key, you know, key part. The other part is the actual expenditures of dollars. And the numbers that we looked at uh, going into Friday was about $225 per member per month. That's the way we do the analysis. Very similar, right, to how you set managed care premiums. It's based on the utilization of services, you know, over the course of a month. Uh, that number looked right to us. Um, you know, I would say the comparable uh, PMPM for somebody who's actually enrolled in Medicaid is somewhere around $500 per member per month. So they're not using like the full benefit package that you would otherwise receive. So those numbers are all, I think, you know, playing out nicely. The, the exact allocation of the $225, um, you know, we're working on that breakout. Uh, as we speak, and it's roughly 80%. I think is more operational, which was our initial model, because we wanted to, you know, uh, and 20% is admin. And Dr. Katz asked us to make our biggest investments into direct patient care. So so far, it look, it's looking okay, because um, we weren't quite sure, you know, when we launched this, how it was going to play out. But I don't. I think we're 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 on track uh, to spend uh, the 75 million dollars. But given the expansion, are, from what I'm hearing, you're planning to spend the increase, you said it's going from $225 per member per month to 500 No, uh, the 225 is, is basically the number that we budgeted, okay. um, you know, in terms of the actual utilization of services. I just referenced the $500 because that was a benchmark that we used, and that's what managed care plans will pay. Uh, you know, for a comparable Medicaid uh, patient. And it seems like, and we weren't quite sure how that was going to play out. It, it's the, the, the preliminary numbers are showing we're getting very, very close to the 225 estimate that we had. And we've also been joined by Council Member Matthew Eugene. So I wanted to ask um, about the Elmhurst daycare closure We've heard um, there's a lot of information out there about what people should do, especially in this kind of climate right now with, with a bit of 
you know, anxiety that the city is going through and what people should do in terms of staying home or taking care of their children or, or what are acceptable places and social distancing. And I, and I just want to thank you all because I know you've been trying your best to put out correct information. But I, I wanted to ask about this very local issue when it comes to child care. And we saw that recent press reports have shed light on the anticipated closure of Little Elms Child Care Center located at Elmhurst Hospital and it's operated by Bright Horizons. This has garnered significant concern from parents, caregivers, and members of the community. What assistance is h and providing to affected parents, especially those parents who are employed at h and in Elmhurst, who are now having to find alternate child care arrangements? And, and the reason why I brought up you know, the coronavirus just now is because you know, our health care workers are going to be working around the clock. They're, they're not really allowed to telecommute. So if you can just answer how are, what assistance is H&H providing to the parents? And um, yeah, if you could give us an update on that. Sure, uh, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm, I, I'm sure Councilmember Moy is in, in uh, close touch with uh, our, our CEO at Elmhurst, Israel Rocha, who is uh, fantastic and uh, has been our, our point person for this. I think the, the overriding uh, uh, direction of it, as I understand it, I haven't been close in the negotiations, has been about you know, providing more slots in the daycare for employees of Elmhurst and, and having subsidized care for them and greater access for our employees to use the services. Um, I don't know the update as of today in terms of their negotiations to reach an agreement. Our hope is certainly to have uh, robust child care services for our employees at our sites. Um, but again, of course, having, having a, a good relationship with that partner and a strong partner who will help us do that uh, is key. As from, a, from a central perspective at Health and Hospitals, certainly have uh, you know, no opposition to support and helping subsidize uh, uh, care for our, for our employees. Um, but it's, it's in our space and making sure Israel has the flexibility he needs to, to have a good partner there and to have space for his employees is our key. So we want to support him and support the needs of the staff at Elmhurst. But I can get back to you with more details on the, the latest in the negotiation and the discussions around that. Certainly understand people's concern. Um, well, how many H&H &H employees who are parents using that Elmhurst daycare, how many of them are affected? Uh, I have to get back to you on the specific numbers. I haven't, I haven't talked to Israel about it in recent days, but I'm happy to get you the details. And um, you know, I know it's a, a focus of his. And again, the, the thrust of the negotiations from his perspective, as I understand it, was to get more spaces for Elmhurst staff in that program. And uh, that's really, that's really going to be his guiding principle, I'm sure. Well, it was reported that H&H &H was considering the possibility of allowing the space to be occupied by, by another child care provider or to be used for clinical needs. Do you have the current status of those plans to repurpose the space, if that's the route you're going to go? I, I don't have that detail. I'm happy to have uh, Mr. Rocha get in touch with, uh, with you and other members of the committee who are closest to this. Um, we have great faith in him, and um, I know the Elmhurst community does as well. So we'll, we'll work to answer any questions and try to get this resolved as soon as possible. All right, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to turn it over to one of my colleagues in a second. Um, I want to ask about, about abortion care clinics throughout the city. <coughs> Last year, the council made a historic investment to directly fund <clears throat> abortion care clinics throughout the city. And what specific resources in terms of funding, facility space, and staff does H&H &H devote exclusively to abortion care? Exclusively to abortion care. I think I have to get back to you with a breakout of any financial numbers about that. We, uh, you know, we uh, have women's health services across all of our facilities, uh, and you know, are are um, deeply invested in providing all the care our patients need. Um, but in terms of a specific financial breakout, I'm going to have to get back. Do you to have you. a team dedicated to coordinating abortion care throughout the system? Our chief medical officer, Dr. Michelle Allen, is an OBGYN by training, and the Women's Health Council across all of our uh, across all of our facilities is is focused on this as part of the continuum of care. Is um, that a yes or a no? Uh, I believe it's a yes. I, I don't. Uh, the, I have to get on the specifics of a team focused on this. I think it would fall in the broader uh, realm of of uh, of uh, OBGYN care that our okay. that our teams provide. Okay. 
Do you know how much H and H expects to spend on abortion care? And we can get back to you on that number as well. That's not a problem. I don't have it here with me, but it will not be a problem to get that to you quickly. All right. I think we have an answer for this next yep. one. As you may recall, this committee held an oversight hearing in January on prenatal care in New York City hospitals, and we heard testimony from advocates about the historic and contemporary underprovision of midwifery services across the hospital system, despite the important role that midwives can play in reducing maternal mortality. Since our conversation in January, what concrete actions has the leadership at H&H &H taken to address maternal mortality and to more meaningfully value and support the work of both midwives and doulas? We, um, we have made uh, significant steps, I think, in, in advancing our prenatal care and maternal health program. Uh, from, from my perspective, this is you know, one, one narrow perspective of growth and trying to support the system. Uh, I've been working extensively on improving our uh, rates for uh, prenatal care and maternity care services and working on direct contracts with unions and other partners to grow the number of patients who can receive our services across the system, which in turn boosts the financial health of our system and allows us to reinvest. Uh, I know a number of facilities, Metropolitan most notably in my mind, uh, invests extensively in midwifery services. That was after the Harlem Center actually closed its midwifery services and they expanded at Metropolitan. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't I'm not familiar with that particular chain of events, but um, I, I know Met has a, a wonderful program and uh, one that people are excited about. Um, Dr. Wilcox and I have talked a number of times about uh, expanding midwifery services around the system. I know Kings and others are, are looking at it. I don't have a specific number on the number of midwives we've hired, but it's a service that is uh, you know, in demand by our communities and uh, valuable to them. Um, so that, that, is, that is the update from, from my perspective as a managed care and growth leader for the system. And I know Dr. Allen and Dr. Wilcox are focused on this and, and I have great faith in them. Great. I am going to turn it over to one of my colleagues right now. Um, <laughs> council member, we've enjoyed my council member, Mark Levine. You're distracting me from my panoramic picture of this important <laughs> right. hearing, but we'll get that later. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thanks to everyone at H&H &H during these difficult times. I know that Dr. Katz is across the river at OEM right now. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I do remain optimistic about our city's chances in the face of the coronavirus challenge is that we have the biggest and best public hospital system in America, and you can't overstate what it means to have 13 acute care hospitals and so many other assets um, when people need health care. Uh, so we thank you for that. And the notion that you'd be taking a financial hit now was already a bad idea, but now I think it's a spectacularly bad idea that we divert resources out of the uh, public hospital system at this incredibly sensitive moment for public health in New York City. And I, I, I want to ask you one or two things about that, but just very quickly, can you confirm, do you have any uh, corona patients in your system at the moment? Uh, or are you not able to? I'm going to refer to Dr. Katz and the public health okay. officials on what, uh, what they can update on that. Okay. Uh, I understand that sense that we have patient confidentiality, but, but that's okay if, uh, if you're able to share with the, us that we would appreciate that. Um, Dr. Katz has explained in some other settings that you're pushing off elective surgery. There are some surgeries, while necessary and important, um, don't have the kind of urgency that others do. Can you in any way, I guess, quantify the, the portion of your procedures which you're able to push back and how much capacity that's freeing up? Um, I, I can't quantify at the moment the number of procedures or other scheduled visits that have been delayed. Uh, I think as a general strategy, that's certainly in flight. Um, and, you know, we can, we can get back to you as that evolves. Um, I, uh, I know the hosp individual hospitals have specific contingency plans and things, but again, I, I apologize that Dr. Katz can't be here to speak to these things with the, the level of expertise and detail that, that really only he has. I, I can speak to the budgetary side of some of these things. But Understood. As, as he's explained it, I think it's important for the public to know it's a really prudent way to free up capacity a little bit ahead of time before you're in the midst of 
overwhelming demand, which we hope never happens, but might. And it does seem like if you can shift things around by a few weeks here and there, you open up beds. Uh, seems like the prudent thing to do, although some of your patients might be grumbling. There's a, a, an important public health interest there. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the, the cuts that you're facing, there's already been a 1% reduction in Medicare payments, correct? Correct. And forgive me if you already explained this, but what will be the impact this fiscal year just based on that 1% reduction? For that 1% cut, I believe we calculated at $35 million, uh, and there are you know, significant other cuts uh, proposed, so it's, it's of great concern. Are you, are you compensating for that by a hiring freeze or any other measures that you can explain? Uh, we have we have a pause on administrative hiring uh, across the system at the at the central level. Certainly, continuing to have all the clinical and other uh, needs we have for for patient care. But uh, at an administrative level, we have paused hiring as the as the budget progresses. It's a minor step we can take, and uh, we we hope that more will not be necessary. So, administrative hiring is not people touching patients directly. It's Correct. not patient care. It's the back office central. Okay. Well, that, it, it's a relief. We know that there's only so much you can take before it does impact the services directly touching patients. It's actually kind of incredible you've been able to shield patients from that so far, but we know that if anything like what's being proposed in what we fear in the state budget cuts to Medicaid, if anything like that comes down, I have to imagine the impact on you as a major Medicare provider will be significant. Could you talk about what that might mean for the system if the proposed more than $2 billion cuts actually come to pass? Sure. Well, I think, you know, Medicaid is a, is a major payer for our system, and so any direct cuts to that program and to our reimbursement in it would be, uh, would be significant. Um, you know, I think the, the mayor's discussion of the overall scale of the, the proposed local share hit is, uh, is pretty dramatic. You know, health and hospitals operating perspective on this is um, that, you know, we, will, we don't want to operate unsafe facilities. We're not going to make cuts in a way that jeopardizes patient care. Uh, the mayor has, you know, just in, as an illustrative example, this total $1.1 billion cut would represent 19 clinics across health and hospitals. Of course, that's uh, illustrative. That's not how we expect the cuts to actually play out. But in terms of the scale, um, that is one example of what it could mean. We know that because of the cost cutting you all have done, there's not a lot of fat left to cut which means you are going to have to really cut into bone and that, that only ends up being bad for patients and the low-income New Yorkers who rely on you. So we're going to fight to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you again and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much and I'd like to turn it over to the fabulous Diana Ayala. <laughs> she skipped me, that's why she used the word fabulous. <laughs> um, I want it on record. But just piggybacking off of what Councilmember Levine said, because I was at a hearing last week and I heard that, well, I, I think one of the questions was related to some clinic closures, potential clinic closures as a result of the state, um, the proposed Medicaid cuts. Are you aware of any H&H &H clinics that may or may not be on the chopping block if those cuts come through? We, we have no plans to do so. I think the mayor's broader statement was illustrative about the sheer scale of these cuts. Mm -hmm. um, if, if cuts do come, it will be a holistic conversation between the council, the administration, and us on how we can best weather them, whether uh, other revenue streams can, can overcome that, whether we can take other actions to address the cuts, but uh, no, no closures planned or, or targeted. That's good news. Um, regarding the NYC care, did, I don't think that, that the chair asked the question about New York City care, but um, we know we, it launched uh, last year in the Bronx and has since, since expanded to Brooklyn and Staten Island. The preliminary budget uh, dedicates 75 million to New York City care for fiscal year 2021, growing from 25 million in the current fiscal year. Given the program's launch and expansion, how does H&H &H plan to spend the increase for fiscal year 21? Sure, I, I, I think as we, the, the overall division of the budget is about 80% clinical and other patient care services and then 20% uh, administration. That sort of fades even more towards the clinical side as the program launches further along. At the upfront, you have upfront expenses like call center, printing, things like that that uh, become less as we go, but roughly 80% personnel and other clinical needs and 20% uh, administrative. 
and I think we're on track with that budget and uh, having great success as the enrollment and, and other clinical measures show. Yeah, congratulations, you've done really well. Um, regarding the correctional health uh, services, so records are scheduled to close by 2026 um, to force smaller jails um, in, in each borough. To what extent has health and hospitals been involved in the capital planning of the new borough-based jails? Were you sworn in? Were you, did you swear hold? We have to swear past you, Dr. Yang. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Hi, it's, it's happy. Yeah, thank you for the question. Just uh, press the, there you go. It's got to be red. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, we have been involved since the beginning um, in the planning for the new borough-based jails, not only um, the siting, but the design and the layout and the number of therapeutic rooms and what the clinic and, and therapeutic spaces would look like. We're, we're expected to have a uh, public design meeting soon in each borough. I think Manhattan has already had one. Um, is is H&H &H, uh, present for those as well? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, does health and hospitals expect any changes related to the delivery of health services as a result of the new borough-based facilities? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Does health and hospitals expect any changes related to the delivery of the health, uh, the delivery of health services, anticipating the closure? I mean, how does the, how does the closure of Rikers Island impact the delivery of, of services throughout the borough-based jails? Uh, no, no real change is anticipated. We're still looking at Bellevue to handle um, mails for inpatient and acute and acute inpatient and specialty services in Elmhurst for females. Um, there will be an impact on uh, two hospitals, Bellevue and Woodhull, not related to the closure of Rikers and the new borough-based jails, but an initiative that uh, Correctional Health Services initiated on its own um, to try and, and improve access to and quality of care for people who have uh, particularly complex needs. Is, do we know where the mental health beds are gonna be going yet? I'm having a hard time here. The mental health beds, I know, is that this room echoes. It's terrible. Um, yeah, uh, we are actually excited. The new borough-based jails will have more, of th more therapeutic housing units than the current jails physically can accommodate, um, including uh, more PACE or PACE-like units. Gotcha, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. Have you, I wanted to hear a little bit about the conversations you've been having, Dr. Dr. Yang, with the Department of Correction or OMB on any needs or, or funding requests related just generally to prisoner or staff safety. And then I wanna ask specifically on how you are making sure that the prisoners and the staff feel safe and prepared given the coronavirus. We recently saw there was something on Twitter over the weekend at a federal uh, correction facility that didn't have soap or the supplies, and we just wanted to ask our city colleagues whether you feel prepared for correctional health services for COVID-19. Thanks for that question. Uh, yes, correctional health services uh, does feel prepared. Um, what we are doing right now is focusing our effort at this point in time of the of the public health response on identifying people who may be of higher concern, um, isolating them and reporting them and, to, and talking to DOHMH as appropriate, sending them to hospital to be tested as appropriate. Um, and that's happening both at pre-arraignment and on intake, new admission. We have a daily fever report um, that picks up when any of our patients on, in our care um, may spike a temperature and, and raises other concerns. Um, we have uh, the communicable disease unit in the West facility that's available um, for isolation, for observation um, for, of patients who we're worried about. Um, we do have um, information going out to staff in terms of precautions and, and our, our clinical protocols, as well as a flyer that's going out to patients um, in terms of what to expect, how to help keep themselves sick, um, healthy. So, 
So you feel prepared, you've kind of informed and trained the staff at the facility. Um, we just want to make sure from, a, from also a budget standpoint, and I know we've talked a little bit about this, is that you, you all feel supported as well and that you have us here being able to lobby for and try to negotiate the services and the support that you need. Yes, very much so. I want to ask what's the criteria for, for testing in the correctional facilities? Um, we're following CDC guidelines as well as state and, and city health department guidelines. Um, they are no different. We're, we are being extra cautious because of the nature of our setting. Um, it's, it's more of a closed and congregate setting than might otherwise exist elsewhere in the city. So you're following CDC guidelines and you're taking extra precaution. What, what is that? What, is, what do you mean by that? Not ex well, extra precautions in that um, we have a, a population of patients who are in our care, um, whom we can monitor with on a daily basis, on a regular basis, more so than um, outside in the community. I also ask because at our at the hearing we had last week that I co-chaired with Councilmember Levine, you know, it's been said I believe it was a couple weeks ago the mayor said that there were 1,200 beds ready. Um, across the system for patients who are confirmed or who need them. I, I had asked, I believe, Dr. Katz, if, if any of those beds were in any of the correctional facilities. They mentioned that at Rikers specifically, there is a quarantine section, but that is just the, a part of kind of your medical services for, for people that are very, very sick. So are you looking to, to change that? Are you planning in case there is a more serious outbreak? Yeah, so so um, within the jail system, uh, Correctional Health Services does have infirmary beds. Um, they're generally for people who are uh, subacute. Um, uh, that is not, not uh, merit needing uh, acute inpatient care in a, in a, in a hospital. Um, we also have the communicable disease unit, which is what I mentioned earlier. These are negative pressure um, rooms, isolated rooms, uh, where we can put people, patients who we need to observe and keep them apart from others. Um, this, this, uh, this is a, an, evol an evolving, rapidly evolving public health response. Um, we are working with DOC to plan and prepare to stand up um, surge capacity if we need to. Um, but at this point in time, we're still looking to hospitals uh, to take care of people when they get to a point where they need acute care. Do you have enough test kits? We are, uh, we're, this is also evolving. Um, we're not testing directly right now. We are sending people to the hospital to have specimens drawn uh, for testing. I'm sorry, so, I, and again, maybe it is because of the echo, but is that a yes or a no? Uh, we're not testing right now directly. We are bringing people to hospitals, and so far there has not been an issue. Have you brought many individuals to hospitals to test from your facilities? No, it's been a couple. Couples too, yeah. right? Okay, I want to just uh, ask uh, different questions um, in terms of the facility and some of the services that you provide. Thank you, Dr. Yang. The adopted fiscal 2020 budget baselined $390,000 in funding for transgender health care training at H&H. &H. What new hiring has this funding allowed for and how many of those positions have been filled? Um, Thank you for that, and thank you for your support of this program. Of course, the, the baseline funds allowed us to continue to employing three community outreach workers uh, with an emphasis on supporting uh, the transgender nonconforming community. They are they report centrally to our office diversity and inclusion, and then they have uh, deep relationships and spend a lot of time at our Pride Health Centers, which are at Metropolitan Hospital, Woodhull, and uh, Judson Health Center, which is here in Lower Manhattan. Uh, so they're continuing to do great work and and. That's what the funds are supporting. So three community outreach workers, correct? Correct. And they're working in the Pride Centers, but not just in the Pride Centers, correct? Correct. They're reporting centrally, so they have responsibility over the whole system. But the Pride Health Centers are a key destination uh, where people are referred and where they have deep relationships with the clinical teams there. But you're right. They work across the system. What has the response been from some of your patients and some of the people that frequent your facilities? Are the services being utilized? Is there a request for more in, in terms of an increase in capacity? Um, I, I haven't seen a request for more in terms of capacity. It's not, it, it could be there. I will, I will inquire about it. Um, 
you know, I think it, it is a, these are services that are, uh, that are certainly valued in the community and needed. I, just as an anecdote, I was working in the referral office at Harlem Hospital, uh, trying to just improve our specialty referral process, and, and an individual walked in uh, seeking services just like this on a Friday afternoon. And so, you know, it was very clear to me that when these services are needed, people need them handled delicately and, um, you know, with, with great urgency and, and great care. Um, so I think that they, they are useful and, and uh, appreciated when we can provide How many people have undergone training to date? Uh, I have to get that number for you. Um, I just need a moment. I'm sorry. I don't have it in front of me. I, well, okay. I ask, this was a, certainly a program that I championed last budget season, as you mentioned. It was very, very important to me. So if you can get us a couple of statistics and facts on just to make sure that we can, in the face of what could be tremendous cuts, again, we all remain optimistic. Um, I wanna make sure that some of the newer programs or I guess some of the smaller programs aren't cut um, and that they are really serving, I think, a, a community that was underserved for a very long time. So if you can get back to me, I would really appreciate that. Of course. So, okay, I'm gonna ask just a couple more questions. And, and I thank you all for being here. So H&H's Sexual Assault Response Team, S-A-R-T, the program consists of specially trained forensic examiners and rape crisis counselors who provide sexual assault victims with forensic and counseling services. However, the program's budget has remained flat at 1.3 million and is expected to be funded at this level in each year of the financial plan. Are the resources devoted to this program sufficient? And has the program been able to maintain reasonable victim wait times in recent years? Again, I'm sorry, I have to get back to you with the details on that specific program, um, but I will certainly do that as quickly as I can. So do you have any information on this program or you're saying you have to get back to me because you, you don't have anything right now? Uh, I, I don't have anything right now. I apologize. Okay. Okay. I guess, I, I guess my last question is going to be on capital needs. Um, I want to make sure there's a, there's a few things that I know we are working on. Again, I have to, I want to make sure, give me one second. The Ida G. Israel Clinic in Coney Island. I just want to bring it up again. I've mentioned it at at least one other hearing. That was a clinic that opened up after Hurricane Sandy. It received millions in FEMA funds, and now, from what I hear, it's 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 a uh, they're threatening to close it. And I think it's such a vital service. So the fiscal 2020 preliminary capital commitment plan entails $499 million in funding for corporate-wide reconstruction related to Hurricane Sandy across the five-year plan period 2020 to 2024, including $109 million in fiscal year 2020 and $192 million in fiscal year 2021. Can you provide a detailed accounting of how, where, and on what specifically these funds are being spent? Uh, I believe we can as we go forward in discussions with the council and with OMB about that. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly we have great capital needs across the system and uh, always appreciate the council's support in advancing that effort. So you're going to get back to me. It's a common refrain of mine. I apologize. But yes. It's okay. You all, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a, a bit of a hall pass on this one because you all are, have a lot going on. but. For the sake of transparency and accountability, I have to give you the same speech every budget, is, is we really want to, to be partners with you. We certainly want to be supportive. So the more information you have for us, the more that we can do in terms of advocating for all of your needs. We're funding EKG machines and trauma slots and, and clinics in outer boroughs to make sure that people have access to what we think is world-class care. So bringing those answers to us during a budget hearing is really, really important, and I think just a sign of good faith between us, and I thought we, we've worked very, very well together. So, I, I mean, 
I do have a lot of questions for you, but I think that we'll probably, I'll check to see if any of my colleagues have questions. Fantastic. Oh, do you want to say something before you're I turn just it following to up on that? I, um, just as a matter of practice, right? We completely agree that transparency is very important on all elements of the budget. Um, and, and one thing we could take away is we certainly could provide you a detailed briefing of our entire capital budget, including the progress we've made in terms of expending the FEMA dollars. So that, that would certainly be no problem at all um, to make make that available. I don't, Christina, you asked. No, and I, and I thank you. And you gave us a great briefing the other day. I just want to be sure that as we have a public meeting and people have access that what uh, they understand what's on the record, where their tax dollars are going, you know the drill. Did you want to add something before I turned it over to Council Member Moya? Yeah, I think I should. To affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and to respond honestly uh, to Council Member questions? I do. Thank you. Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President, Office of Facilities Development. Just to follow up with John's uh, comment, we're happy to come visit your office and any other council members to give a full update of our FEMA funds. Uh, across the system and where those dollars are already committed as well as being spent to date. As you could see at Coney Island, the new CSS building is well underway. The uh, topping off ceremony just happened recently. There's investment happening at Metropolitan as well, well as Bellevue and Kohler. So we're happy to do a FEMA briefing for uh, the council, for you as well as other council members as requested. Did you say Kohler as well? Yeah, we're, we're working with OEM and putting um, HESCO barriers up. There's been many mitigation projects that have happened to elevate uh, certain critical infrastructure at our locations. We call them the priority mitigation projects, and many of those projects are ac actually at the closeout phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Moya? Yeah, I, I'll just mention just to, to follow up on that, and we, we know that the total allocation from FEMA is about 1.85 billion. 1.7 billion is is really been targeted with projects, and we've spent about 500 million dollars. But what lies underneath this is what I think you really want to see is the, is the detail in case you want to supplement it in areas that uh, you feel is, there's Correct. additional need. So. Correct, and I understand you know FEMA money is federal, and and we have enough a difficult time just tracking it and trying to get an audit and, and, and that goes across the board in the work they're doing in public housing and our public hospital system. But um, in terms of capital, again, we want to make sure that, that we're funding, especially the, the clinics. I just want to emphasize that because if we're trying to make sure that people are staying out of the emergency room and receiving primary care, then they should build that relationship at a local clinic with a doctor. So thank you. Council Member Moya, finally. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly on uh, uh, DISREP. Why was DISREP not um, renewed, and what will happen to the unspent funds? Uh, so DISREP was not renewed. The, the federal government has its you know, stated reasons in a, a one-page letter, I believe. Uh, it was a five-year waiver and five-year program, uh, uh, so that, that is the nature of it. Some of the unspent funds, the unearned funds, I'd say, will, uh, will just not be earned and will certainly not pass to the PPS, health and hospitals, or uh, or any other partners around the system. Um, the unspent funds within uh, One City Health and other PPSs, uh, I think, are in the process of being allocated or have been allocated through contracts and others, uh, both to support our safety net system and the core operations we have, and then to go to CBO partners and others who are uh, helping advance our mission and the goals of DISRP, which remain the goals of health and hospitals, to reduce avoidable hospital utilization and to uh, have a more a holistic approach to the care of our patients rather than strictly hospital-based. So continuing CBO partnerships and other things like that will, will be a key <coughs> part of our strategy going forward. Uh, no, all the money is, is not currently allocated. Um, I'm sorry, are you speaking about at the state level or within at the state level? Um, I can't speak to the, to the state's path. Within the, the performing provider system, One City Health, uh, where we've earned several hundred million dollars. Uh, the vast majority of it is committed and dedicated to, to ongoing projects like the Express Care at Elmhurst and other things like that that help us keep people healthy and out of the emergency room. So that is our focus and where we've been. Of course. Madam Chair. Okay. So I think we're gonna, let me just ask you one question on Metro Plus. H&H &H is committed to increasing the share of Metro Plus's 
Metro Plus health plans and medical spending within the health system reported at 39.9% for the first four months of fiscal year 2020 in the PMMR. What is the value proposition that H and H can offer to one prospective Metro to one prospective Metro Plus en enrollees and two current Metro Plus enrollees choosing to utilize services outside of H and H? Oh, thank you for that question. I think that the value proposition is really uh, integrated care with a health plan and a hospital system that are committed to your health rather than uh, strictly to their bottom lines. Um, the administrative processes and the speed with which uh, people get their care and get things approved and don't have to deal with uh, extensive billing is, is a key part of the value proposition for a Metro Plus member coming to health and hospitals. Uh, and then, you know, the broad array of services we offer across our entire system and, and Metro Plus's broader network uh, are, are a major value proposition for anybody thinking about their health insurance options. And uh, like I have, Metro Plus has uh, been great health insurance. So how closely are any efforts to improve patient quality integrated with your Metro Plus engagement and growth strategy? Which there, the, the January 2021 transformation plan asserts is expected to yield $100 million in fiscal year 2020 and $135 million in each of the latter years. Right, uh, how close are our clinical quality strategies engaged in that? I think they're, they're front and center, right? I think uh, growth in our system is, is about uh, showing people the quality of the care we offer, making it clear to them that uh, as every NYC care member has seen, you can get an appointment within two weeks, you can get after hours pharmacy care, uh, you can get the specialty care you need in a timely way. Um, that's a key part of it and then um, you know, continuing to improve on our patient experience scores and other key quality measures um, are a key part of this. Our clinical leadership at Health and Hospitals work very closely with Metro Plus. Uh, several of them are on the Quality Assurance Committee of the Metro Plus Board and other informal partnerships like that to, to make sure we have a joint and shared quality improvement approach. Okay. Well, please uh, certainly um pass on my greetings to Dr. Katz and let him know he was missed, but thank you very, very much for coming and answering our questions and giving testimony. I'll make sure that if any of my colleagues want a, a detailed briefing, they'll be sure to contact you. And I hope at the, at the next hearing, we'll have some more numbers attached to some of the answers to our questions. But I do thank you both for all that you're doing, especially at this very heightened time um, in New York City. And, and, and with that, just have a great day. Thank you for your support. I'm going to call the next panel, Ralph Palladino and Nasha Diaz. Do you need physical therapy? Because I can get you some. Do you, do you know who's going to go first? Me? Ralph? Uh, okay. Good day. Uh, Ralph Palladino, Clerical uh, Local 1549, DC 37. Um, we represent the frontline um, non-medical uh, employees in ambulatory care, emergency rooms, outpatient uh, financial counseling, and Metro Plus HMO. Uh, greetings to City Councilwoman and um, the Chair, and my City Councilwoman, I have to say, and I'm very happy to say that. The coronavirus spread and the influenza epidemic are reminders that a strong public health system is needed in this city and country. The human cost in lives and economic ripples the virus attack is causing proves this. We need an expansion of public health programs at all levels of government. It certainly makes no sense to be proposing cutting public health programs. We are lucky in New York City to have a strong public health system now, we could be better, but we're still very lucky compared to the rest of the country. The New York City Health and uh, Hospitals is taking a lead in this, um, ha has improved 
uh, on its access and serving the communities in New York the last couple of years. It has stepped up big time in this crisis, all thanks to the mayor for instituting New York City Cares, the leadership at New York City Health and Hospitals of Dr. Katz, and the dedicated, hardworking staff of the health facilities and Metro Plus HMO. Local 15. 49 leadership has, and staff have been working with Dr. Katz to improve the system. There are areas of concern that we have concerning contracting out of staff to private agencies that are now being alleviated, not totally yet, but getting there. Institutions um, are, are now using patient representatives, our titles as well in 1549, for face-to-face -face interpretation more. This is good and leading to higher quality. More needs to be done. We cannot afford the state's proposal of, no, I'm sorry. It, that's the problem with that. My apologies. You got it? I got it. We're at some of the call, right? <laughs> um, all right. We think that privatization has no place in the public health system. Uh, and this includes in the call centers where some call centers are still privatized. Patient confidentiality and quality control are then problematic when that happens and continues. Now, the immediate threat to public health. We cannot afford president, the president's ending disrip uh, payments to New York State, costing uh, health and hospitals up to $136 million, and his $1 trillion in proposed cuts to Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. Hospitals cannot afford this cutting of Medicare payments to them as well. Ice raids in our city and elsewhere will just drive immigrants into the dark. They will not seek health care that they need when some fall ill. It will be a greater threat to all of us as a result. And here I would just add, there should not be the racist and misguided attacks on Asian Americans in the city and elsewhere uh, because they are not responsible for this virus any more than what's going on in Italy and any more than Italians and Italian Americans are responsible. So that has to end. We need unity and sanity right at this point. We cannot afford our state government's proposal of cutting $1.4 billion to Medicaid and more than $2.5 billion in savings, which are cuts. H&H &H has an overhead of 3%. You tell me where they're going to save. And that just means cuts. Uh, and that's coming from the state's Medicaid redesign team. The result of state cuts alone could be closing of 19 community clinics and layoffs of 1,300 workers. The ripple effect on city workers will be felt in all agencies. The local economy will take a hit. More funding in this state is needed for public health and nonprofits who treat the indigent and uninsured population. Medicaid payments to huge private nonprofit healthcare systems will only marginally treat those in need at the expense of the medical institutions, public and private, who, may be, who mainly take care of the indigent, is unfair. The, al the alternative to cuts is to fully implement the state assembly's proposal to tax the very rich in order to raise revenues in the state. Corporations pay little or nothing in taxes, must pay their fair share. So what we need from the city council in asking, the city must continue to commit to supporting New York City health and hospitals, the entire city council must continue to pressure the state government officials and representatives forcefully not to cut Medicaid programs. Medicaid dollars should follow where Medicaid patients are. It must be made clear to Albany that New York City Health and Hospitals must get their, its fair share of funding. Medicaid and the indigenous, indigenous, indigenous targeted dollars must follow where these patients are treated. To that end, the Gottfried Rivera legislation being supported that helps guarantee this um, is, needs to be supported. We need fair taxation as well. Finally, we must all make sure that the President's and the U.S. Senate's plans for cutting to public health programs be thwarted at the ballot box in November. In the meantime, we must speak up. Thank you. I'm just going to, Ralph, can I ask you a question? Okay, then we're gonna, I just wanna ask whether you feel your members have the necessary safety equipment and training and preparation for the coronavirus. Um, certainly compared to the past, we have not been, we, in the past we had the clerical uh, 
folks like in the emergency room, say, might have been excluded from meetings and things like that. But the, this administration under Dr. Katz has been much more inclusive and he listens and he gets around. And so uh, it's much better than it was. Whether I can't, I ha I'd have to survey a little bit more in depth if there are, are, are problems, but I haven't heard of any problems. I heard better things this time around. That's great. And, and if you do hear anything, you know, I, I totally agree with the things that you say you need from the city council. I think mm -hmm. that's our obligation to support you and your local and all of the locals out there. So thank you for your testimony. Right. It's not just me. It's all of us. Right? I said all of them. Okay. Everyone. Right. Ms. Thank Diaz. You. Good afternoon. My name is Naisha Diaz and I'm a government relations associate at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. I want to thank the committee, Committee Chair Carlina Rivera, Speaker Corey Johnson and the rest of the city council for your continued support. Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, formerly Planned Parenthood of New York City, has been a trusted provider of sexual and reproductive health services for more than 100 years. In recent years, PBGNY and the patients we serve have faced continued attacks by the Trump-Pence administration. As a result of changes to the federal Title, X, Title X rule, PBGNY was forced to formally withdraw from the program, and we are relying on the investment from the New York City Council to add an enhancement to the Reproductive Health Initiative to enable PPGNY to continue to provide free and low-cost reproductive health care. Funding from the Reproductive and Sexual Health Initiative also helps PBGNY provide educational services to youth in targeted neighborhoods throughout through the Youth Health Promoters Program. Youth Health Promoters are a group of highly trained peer educators who Ed, engage other youth um, about teens' rights and access to health and reproductive health care. In 2019, the Youth Health Promoters reached 200 youth in workshops and an additional 1,700 youth through outreach events. PPGNY also respectfully requests an enhancement to the dedicated contraceptive fund allocation in order to continue to provide the insertion and removal of long-acting reversible contraceptive devices free of charge to clients who are uninsured, ineligible for public insurance coverage such as Medicaid, and struggle to pay for their services out of pocket. Additionally, with all services, we provide sliding scale services to patients who are not able to use their insurance due to confidentiality concerns. PBGNY is also requesting an allocation under the Trans Equity Programs Initiative to continue to provide gender-affirming hormone therapy to all of our New York City health centers. In 2019, PBGNY conducted over 1,200 patient visits for hormone therapy. The cost of medication associated with this care can be burdensome, even for those who are insured. We will use these funds to empower the trans and gender nonconformity populations to lead healthy lives by providing accessible, culturally competent, and gender-inclusive care. For the past seven years, the New York City Council has generously supported PPGNY's commitment to ending the epidemic. We appreciate these allocations and request enhancements to expand this work through our Project Street Beat program. Project Street Beat is a renowned program that brings critical health, education, and other supportive services directly to thousands of HIV positive individuals and those at high risk for the for contracting the HIV infection. In 2019, PSB provided over 900 clinic visits, including PrEP, PEP, STI testing and treatment, birth control, PAP smears, routine gynecological care, as well as conducted 1,200 HIV tests, distributed 24 Narcan kits, and 70 syringe packs each month. We also request funding for Project Street Beat under the Viral Hepatitis Prevention Initiative to expand our ability to train HIV prevention specialists to provide hepatitis counseling and rapid hepatitis C screening. Increased screening and intervention for people who use drugs, offer linkage to HIV, HIV, HBV vaccinations, and offer fentanyl strips as part of our opioid overdose training. PPGNY is committed to providing culturally competent health care and education to all. We are respectfully request we are respectfully requesting first-time allocations under the Access Health and Immigrant Health Initiatives. Under the Access Health Initiative, PPGNY seeks to expand to sexual and reproductive health care and information for immigrant New Yorkers through our Promotores de Salud program. Promotores de Salud are native Spanish-speaking peer advocates and educators who integrate sexual and reproductive health information about health topics and the health care system into their community's culture, language, and value system, thus reducing many of the obstacles that Latinx communities face in obtaining these services. In 2019, Promotores de Salud engaged over 4,000 people through, through their high-quality community health worker model. And with this funding from the Council, P Promotores de Salud and Project Street Beat can continue to address barriers to care. Under the Immigrant Health Initiative, PBGNY seeks to address structural barriers such as immigration status and language access that impact health by training additional staff to provide high quality medical interpretation. In 2019, 18% of Project Street Beat Mobile Health Center patients were monolingual Spanish speakers. 
um, who required medical interpretation services. We are grateful for the support and funding that we, are rec we have received from the New York City Council and New York City agencies, including DOHMH, and are excited to maintain and expand PBGNY services in New York City. We will continue to provide compassionate and culturally responsive health care to all our patients despite the federal landscape. We thank the Council for your support in this critical effort. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to, I, I tried to ask the administration a little bit about abortion care. They didn't really have too many numbers, but I know that, that they do provide these services at their facilities ac across the city. So I'm just curious as to the relationship between Planned Parenthood of Greater New York and H&H &H and whether, how well do you partner on, on referrals and making sure that you're, you know, you're serving the most people? Um, so I can get back to you with more general information. Um, from top of mind, what comes to mind is in the past year, um, Planned Parenthood of New York City received funding to partner with H&H &H facilities at school-based clinics um, to train them to provide long-acting reversible contraception and contraception and reproductive health services to students and individuals at H&H &H facilities. Um, in terms of referrals, I can talk to our clinical staff and get back to you with more information. Okay. And, and we have, I noticed, uh, you know, in terms of LARCs and the gender-affirming hormones uh, therapy and all, all of these, we have actually a very big hearing coming up on, on reproductive uh, health and justice, and we have a package that, that supports a lot of these initiatives. And so I saw some of your, your requests for an increase in funding, and we realized how critical the services are that you provide to all New Yorkers. So thank you so much for coming in to testify. And I'm not sure if there was anything else you wanted to add, Ralph. I can't believe you're speechless. It's the first time. You did, you did great. You did great. You did great. You did great. Okay. Well, thank you so much to the both of you for testifying. You know, we'll be, we have many more hearings ahead of us. I hope you'll join us. And if you need anything in the future, please consider our office a resource. Thank you so much. So we're actually going to leave the roll open for the next 15, 20 minutes or so in case anybody wants to come in and testify. Matt, did you bring me numbers? <laughs> I'm just, okay, okay. I'm, t I'm kind of.
And seeing no further members of the public to testify, I adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much.